So I'm here in the outskirts of Glasgow. I'm just about to see Mackie and their partner, Ren. Mackie is a composer, programmer, and an all-round nerd, and they've invited us to come to their house. Hi, Hi Ren. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Great to see you. Uh, Where's Mackie? Uh, um, Mackie, um, Mackie. Saxon Alba here. Is she in here? Uh, Mackie. Uh, no. Morning, uh, how are you? Uh, it's Al. Oh, we're here to film. Oh, oh. I think she might need a cup of coffee, Ran. Oh, you're not my mom. You can't tell me what <laughs> I, I'm doing. certainly not your mom, but I'm still here to film. So let's go, son. Uh. My name is Maki Amazaki. I'm trans and a games developer, self taught engineer, queer, musician. Artist, mentor, night owl. I thought we might work on this. Do a lot of fixing of computers, and this one has some faults. I hate it when old tech is just kind of like relegated to die, and it doesn't have to, especially stuff like this that was very easy to fix. So this is a usual activity in the morning for you? Yeah, pretty much. It's really relaxing, kind of working with this sort of thing. Though it requires knowledge, it doesn't require too much thinking. Almost meditative, you know, it sort of gives me time to think about life, the universe, and everything else whilst I'm fixing old tech. <laughs> Why do you love doing this so much? Part of it is just kind of like that innate curiosity that I've I've had since I was a kid. I used to love taking things apart, you know, much I'm sure to my parents' dismay. So part of it as well is making sure that things like this don't end up in a skip. A lot of people say to me, oh, this technology is obsolete, but I love them. And there are lots of people who still love these devices. And I think we're getting to the point where nostalgia is starting to kick in. Uh, it's kind of past that point where they're old and now they're vintage. So what exactly does this do? It can do anything your heart desires. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the day, these were used for a lot of tasks. These days, a lot of people play games on them, but what I really like doing is programming them. These kind of computers are really good for learning to program on because you just turn it on and you're presented with the programming environment. All right, so let's fire this thing up then. Mm -hmm. This is the memory testing screen. And normally it would boot into, oh gosh, that looks bad. Something is obviously drastically wrong um, with the RAM. And so I'm gonna attempt to fix it today. So did you do a lot of this growing up as well? Yeah, mostly I would take things apart and have a look and sort of see how they work. A bit and like Björk did in her famous video, yes. <laughs> <laughs> where she takes apart the TV. She's like, oh, it looks like a tiny city. I've switched the t TV off and now I want to see how it operates. This is what it looks like. Look at this. This looks like a city, like a little model of a city. And all the houses which are here and streets. This is maybe an elevator to go up, up there. And here are all the wires. You made me wince so much watching that video, but it was really good. So what was it like growing up for you? Did you know, you know, when you were taking apart things that you were trans? Being trans became more apparent as I got older. I always knew deep down, but I didn't understand how gender operates in society, probably because I was too busy doing stuff like this. As a kid, I didn't fit in for so many reasons. Being trans was only one of them. I didn't think it was weird to have friends who were girls and kind of to want to wear dresses. I didn't really wear dresses that much these days, uh, contrary to popular belief about trans women. <laughs> and my parents never tried to exclude me from social activities, but I was always just much happier doing this. Kind of part of who I am. At what time did you realize that you were trans? 
That is a good question. I didn't really know what being trans meant when I was younger. For the longest time, it feels, I just kind of accepted that this is the way life is and that I have to just put up with it. When I was about 16, I discovered what help I could actually get to really live my life properly. Everything before then just seems like such a horrible blur of of awfulness. Did people not take you as seriously as a trans person because of your disability? I think maybe there's an assumption that if you're both disabled and queer, you can't be two things at once. Well, I'm a person of colour as well. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a unique mix of uh, lots of different things and it's just the way I am. Sometimes I fear one day people's minds will just start exploding everywhere because they will realise that the world doesn't operate exactly as they see the world. Everybody needs to be able, not only to be able to access, you know, the discussion, but they need to be physically able to access the spaces as well. It seems like such a given thing that people would do that, but there are still so many problems with inclusion of especially disabled people within the trans community. Let's say you hold an event and you're not sure if anyone in a wheelchair is going to come. If you make it accessible, you can find out whether or not people actually arrive and it may not be like your first choice of venue but if i can't go how is it any choice for me right well it's time to start soldering safety precautions first what are your plans for the future mikey what's coming up next for you it's been a really difficult year for me and right now i'm just trying to focus on being glad that, you know, I have lovely people in my life and keep myself working on something that I'm interested in. I often think about what our, our needs as, as people are and the idea of fun and recreation and art is often undervalued and appreciated. And it's hard for me to imagine a world where those things don't exist. The way I see it is what is even the point of eating and breathing and seeking shelter if we don't have those things in our lives. Focus on being happy, not at the expense of others and trying to make everybody happy as much as possible. And even though these computers uh, can seem very obsolete, if people enjoy making them and they're, they're learning and being engaged, who's to say that they're obsolete in any way? Uh, for me, these Machines deserve to be alive and we don't need to be buying the next phone upgrade. You know, we could be focusing on what is really important, which is having a good time, enriching our souls, being good to one another and looking after everyone in society. I guess doing this kind of stuff really gives you a lot of time to think. I'm Paige and I'm trans and a makeup artist, a friend, a daughter, a sister, non-identical twin, an auntie, a kind person and a dog lover. Hey! How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good, you? Yeah? <laughs> yeah, really good, thanks. Should we go for a little walk? Yeah, let's do it. Alright, perfect. <laughs> I've just started doing like Instagram and doing all makeup shbobs and all that stuff. Like, I want to help people feel as confident as they can because being a makeup artist, my favourite thing is when they finally see the whole the whole thing in their face just lights up and they see how much more confident and see it build up in them straight away like oh. that. I love it, it's amazing. So tell me a little bit about what happened when you were younger. I used to get physically bullied. I used to get like pushed downstairs and I had my nose broken. They felt that I was too feminine. And cause I never come out as gay or anything, cause I didn't feel gay, I um, got ridiculed really bad for it. And I had no friends at all. I was so insecure and self-conscious and so shy that I wouldn't have said anything back. I didn't fight back at all. I've been called every name under the sun and I've had everything done, you know. I've been physically assaulted. I don't get scared of bullies anymore. Now that I'm who I am, I'm so confident now. If they don't like it, don't look. It was bad at times, like, you know, I 
I came home and cried a lot. But after I came out and dealt with, you know, moving schools and everything like that, I don't take shit anymore, you know? You can't be doing that nowadays. If someone was to try and say to me what they'd say back then, I'd be like, you're jealous. <laughs> See you later. But like, That's I, the yeah, only way, Yeah, isn't nowadays, it? You, I feel people, even though they can struggle with it, they need to try and have as much self-love as they can. Yeah. Especially for a trans person, we work so hard to be who we are and to like express the way we are. Yeah, but, just to feel comfortable in yeah, our own skin. Yeah, and I think if we work so hard to do something, we should be proud of the work that we've done. Yeah, Let's too, be real, you know? Yeah, too right, Paige. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about what's happened in the past year or so for you. A lot. I had weight loss surgery. Wow. Yeah, I've lost 12 stones since then. Wow, so like in a year and two months, you've lost 12 stones. It, not even in two months, like oh it's just a year. Wow, so what's yeah. that been like for you? I know, it's just like another journey. I've been through worse. Mm -hmm. Why did you have that surgery? I wouldn't have been able to have my bottom surgery if I was that big. So the hospital said to me, look, we need to get your weight down so that we can complete your transition. Mm. The idea of people having to have weight loss surgery yeah. is a bit flawed in a way because it's based on this idea that skinny people are like healthy yeah. when actually that's yeah. not necessarily the case. Yeah. You know I might look a bit chunky and thick. I'm actually like really healthy now so that's that's a good improvement. That's good yeah. But I feel like a lot of women feel like skinny 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 like they find it upsetting that that's what the media has kind of made. It's like their idea of beauty. Idealised like a skinny yeah. Dick woman. All body types, Amazing. as long as you're happy, healthy, that's all that really matters, yeah, isn't yeah. it? And that there are so many different types of bodies. And yeah. I went through like some bad stuff after my weight loss surgery, you know. I no longer feel hunger or have an appetite. So, because I didn't feel the need to eat or I wasn't hungry and I didn't have an appetite, mm -hmm. I thought, what's the point of it? Right. And then I ended up getting like a really bad vitamin deficiency that I'm working through now. I wasn't supposed to lose it as fast as I did. I think being as big as you are and finally seeing the scales go down, I was kind of obsessed. Oh, there's another three pounds, there's a stone gone, there's that, blah, blah, blah. But now it's like, I'm happy where I'm at, but everything nowadays is body image. You know, you've got Instagram, right. Facebook, YouTube, yeah. everything's how to look better, how to look better, how to look better, That's not right. how to be you. I don't care if you're huge, I don't care if you're small, I don't care if you're tall, I don't care if you're short, I don't care if you're struggling. I'm just gonna, I just wanna help, you know? I just want to be happy, you know? So, I have a, a bit of a surprise for you. Okay. So, all you have to do is just turn around and... Oh my God, Charlie! <laughs> Hey. Hi, oh baby. God. How are you? I'm good. I missed you so much. I missed you too. Thought we could have like a, a nail session or something. Yeah. 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 All right. So Paige, you started your transition about 12, didn't you? Yeah. So what happened with you in the school? Did you end up leaving the school or? I left the school because I was transitioning like really, really privately, like just at home. We were like at a family friend's. And we were going to Asda and a girl saw me from that school and started like, throwing stuff at me and I just called my mum. I was like, nope, not going back. And I think the saddest thing is like hearing your story now yeah. is that so much of it is like a reflection of my story. And I went to school like 10 years before you. And what makes me so sad is that people think like everything's fine now for yeah. like LGBT people in schools. And like, it's really not. Yeah. Like it it's really still a taboo, it's so you know? bad yeah. how it's still happening. And this is in England in 2019. Yeah. I went to a Catholic school as well where they were just like they didn't actually want to help. They didn't it was want a, to help they it. didn't yeah. and they, they didn't actually make... care. They don't they did, it's not in their interest yeah. to help because they don't actually believe in LGBT rights themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So they're living proof basically that trans people can have blockers at the right time they need it, surgeries yeah. hopefully around the right time that they yeah. want it. Have you got a message for anyone about... Stick with it. Okay, that, I know that sounds weird, but I've been friends with a lot of trans people that feel like it's too tough. The waiting time's too long, but try and stick with it because you'll be so much happier in the long run. I would say I'm quite lucky as in like, I did come out really young and I did start medically transitioning really young. There are other people that aren't so lucky and I haven't had it as half as hard as some people. I know it sounds weird, but I don't want to be what people look to to see as a trans person. Yeah, I am trans and yeah, I, I appreciate who I am, but I'm not, I'm not going to be known for trans. I don't want to be known for being trans. Yeah, because you know? you're so much more than that. Right? Yeah. So exactly, you don't want to be just trans, you want to just 
just be you. There's so much more to us as people. It's a physical transition. Nothing yeah. else changes. It's an alignment of the inside and the outside. Yeah. Oh, that's so, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think that's why me and you get on so well. You know, because we have been through a lot of the same things and we did come out at similar times. I think we both want to spread a message i think i think you're doing it the best way that you probably possibly could oh, thank you Paige. i love it so much you are my inspiration Paige. like you're oh. like a big reason i do what i do like meeting you so early on in my own transition i was just like the fact that i heard about what you were going for i was like it's so bad that this is still happening and i was like we need to be talking about this as a society we need to be having these conversations because this should not be happening in our country in yeah. 2019 so you're my inspiration oh. <laughs> <laughs>
Yay! <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Should we go have a cup of tea? Yes, go have a cup of tea. <laughs> so, this is quite an impressive collection, I have to say, <laughs> and quite massive trophies as well. Mm. This shelf is pretty much everything that I won pre transition. When you just compare this, it's like the most visual representation, really, of how transitioning has really unlocked my whole performance as an athlete. The last six years has just been me taking control of my life and the way that's manifested itself in my career has just been nothing short of groundbreaking. Have you seen the video of the American woman at the petrol station in a Tesla? No. Uh, it's like, it's so amazing because there's some people behind videoing her and they're just absolutely pissing themselves laughing. Why she gets she out, I don't know, because like, she's just, I don't know, I guess it's saying like the battery's low or something. <laughs> I remember there being a very particular moment in my life where I had to sort of take the plunge and transition. What was your catalyst in deciding to transition? I ended up in a, a really dark place where I, I really just lost all sense of my own identity. I look in the mirror and I just think, I don't know who the hell I am anymore. I got so depressed, I was having a nervous breakdown and I was, you know, I was suicidal. And to, to such an extent, you know, I, I really was going to take my own life because I just couldn't see any way that I could resolve this that wasn't going to end in a lot of pain. Thankfully, I didn't. I just realised actually there's only really one way out of this and that's transition because I I want to carry on living and to, to do anything else would have been crazy. I'm very good at applying myself to something and if I say this is what I'm going to do, whatever that thing is, if it's a half marathon, a race, I'll do it and I'll just push myself to whatever limit I have to do to achieve that. And I think once I'd said, okay, this is it, this is the only way forward I'm doing this, it, it did feel like a positive step. And I'd been running away from something my whole life and suddenly I was running towards the thing that I knew was the thing that I had to do and that that in itself is quite a, is a positive thing mm -hmm. yeah I'm in the south of England, about to meet Kachenga, a prolific writer and campaigner. Joining us are our dogs, Soldier and Nini. Hi, uh, Hi Nini. <laughs> How are you? We're really well. Good to see you guys. I'm Kachenga, all caps. I'm trans and I'm also a writer. I'm an agitator. I'm a public speaker. I'm a daughter. I'm a sister. I'm a great friend. Yeah, I'm much more than trans. I would love to touch people deeply with my writing. That is probably my biggest ambition. What sort of writing do you do? Most of the writing I do is in response to pop culture and issues of gender and race in the modern world. But in terms of what really gets me going spiritually, it's just indulging my imagination. I always imagined that I would be able to indulge my fiction writing. And when I wake up in the morning and turn over and start writing immediately, I'm able to capture some of the magic in my mind. <laughs> Are you working on any sort of novels or anything like mm. that? Yeah, my first novel, it's been percolating for two and a half years. The protagonist is trans. I see it as my responsibility to put trans characters into other people's imaginations and to increase the possibilities of our lives. Born free. <laughs> so I'm always interested in sort of what drives people and mm -hmm. um, what people are passionate about. 
And what got you into writing and why are you so passionate about writing? I started writing for my own survival really. When I was in rehab for my drug and alcohol addiction, I just needed to reveal myself to myself. Up until that point I hadn't been truthful about my desires, my ambitions, who I really was. And it wasn't my intention to really share my work at first and I needed that time. My bedroom was basically like a laboratory, you know. Yeah, all of that unpressured writing gave me the confidence to write for the public. You know, the fear of being alone kept me from transitioning for so many years. I was very impacted by films like The Crying Game. Listen, there's something I should tell you. She's uh, swaggering. <laughs> I really didn't want to be considered a joke to counteract all the transphobia that I had taken in over the years. I imagined a relationship with a masculine, straight identified male would, you know, prove to them, look, look, see how wanted I am. And to be honest, I got that in more than one relationship. It wasn't enough. It didn't make me feel as whole as when I'm sitting in my pajamas at home, makeup free, and I've come to the end of the page. Do I really think that when I'm at the top of the aisle and I'm wearing the expensive dress, that that's gonna be the nexus of success for my life as a trans I don't think so. I think I'll feel a lot more fulfilled when I touch my first book. I had to get used to being so marginalised so early on. A lot of my dreams were dispelled. I think there's a depressive side to that in that I never got the chance to blossom in my youth in the way that I wanted to. But in that I have discovered a liberation. Being a writer means that I'm able to live a multitude of lives, to empathise with others and I'm ultimately able to empathise with myself after a lifetime of self-hate and repression. Now, I don't write with a fountain pen, but my pen is very much a fountain. In the future, where do you see yourself heading as a writer and as uh -huh. a, an agitator and as a, <laughs> as a person? The life expectancy for trans women of colour in the US is 35. Coming up to that age is poignant. It's still significant for me. I see myself living a life unaffected by um, dysphoria. As it dissipates and I become more comfortable in my body and what I see in the mirror, I get to focus on what's inside. Through transition, we're able to validate a spirit and I do very much feel that you know that the divine feminine in me is being made manifest my dress size is the biggest it's ever been but it goes hand in hand with my depleting dysphoria and that I don't want to lose weight I don't want to I don't want my body to be different I want to fall in love with myself as I am I want to really fall in love with myself as a big black fat woman way I experience so much more desire and pleasure in my body now that I am definitively plus size BBW whatever you want <laughs> I really am so much more comfortable as I fall in love with myself and writing the stories that I know I need to tell um, I can imagine myself just expanding and expanding and yeah just filling myself up with love as I give it to the world, yeah. <laughs>Sterling in Scotland to meet Mriddle, who's a trans woman who also runs a rape crisis centre. Let's go say hello. I am Mriddle Wadwa. I am trans and a Piscean, a mother, a wife, half Zoroastrian, half Hindu. I'm an immigrant. 
I run a rape crisis center. I'm a feminist. I'm a boss. And I speak my mind even when I shouldn't. So, Myrtle, tell me a bit about where we are okay. and how you came about to mm -hmm. work here. So this is the Fourth Valley Rape Crisis Center and I am the manager. So the center works with anyone over the age of 13 who's experienced sexual violence and anyone who's affected by it. The center is part of the rape crisis movement. So we are a women only space in the sense that only women work in the center, although we work with anyone who's been affected irrespective of gender identity. I think some of the key things that I'm really proud of that has happened in this movement is the increased awareness about forced marriage in Scotland and how we worked pretty hard to make sure that the law was implemented effectively. And most of our services, Violence Against Women services, largely cater to white cis women. But, but there are others who, who don't naturally come to our spaces. Like you can't expect people to know that you are inclusive if you're not explicit of your inclusion. So I think our journey around inclusion as a violence against women's movement is we are getting there. But I think there are some key things that we have to do and consistently because equality is so fragile. I spend most of my life thinking about the status of minority ethnic women and migrant women in particular. Any minority who experiences oppression, you expect to be treated badly wherever you go. And so you steal yourself up for that. So when you say we are inclusive, well, you have to show how, what are you doing not to treat people badly. Can you connect with people's humanity? For me, it is an investment in attitude. Like we need to expose ourselves to difference so that the difference is normal. We just tend not to think of ourselves as different. Is there a personal reason for getting into this line of work? Staying on has been personal because it was pretty clear to me that I was the only trans woman in the women's aid movement. And I wasn't even sure whether I would have been hired if they had known that I was trans. When I came out individually to various colleagues, there was this disbelief, oh, you can't be trans. Like, you know, what does a trans person look like? What does a cis woman look like? How do we know? Over a period of time, it became more and more important within my work in this movement to be a trans woman. My activism wasn't around trans activism because really what mattered to me more was my status as an immigrant woman and the women I worked with who came from immigrant backgrounds. I had the opportunity to deliver trainings across this country and so invariably I would come out in all of my trainings, not just for people to change their perception of what an immigrant woman looks like or is or who she is, but also the, what a trans person looks like, you know? So I think staying in it has become a personal thing. So tell me what it was like growing up for you and who was the first trans person that you met? So I grew up in India. To me now, I would say it was like living in a war zone and it really came home to me, I really understood it when people started speaking about the civil war in Syria and the use of snipers. And you know, that's the analogy I use, like a sniper would hit me every day, multiple times, from name calling to sexual violence. All of that happened all the time. When I became an adult, when I began to think a lot more practically and seriously about my transition, it was empowering to have grown up in a country where there is a, a recognition of the third gender or, you know, of the non-binary in a sense. A trans person I identified with, I don't think I ever met one. I didn't have any resources. I didn't know where to go. And then I remember a chance upon this article, a journalist had written an article about how they had set up a helpline for trans people. So I went to meet this journalist and then they put me in touch with the local government psych hospital psychiatric unit which is a complete nightmare, where this guy essentially told me, I don't believe you're trans because you would have insisted to go to a girl's school. Why did you go to a boy's school and all this sort of shit? I was like, you know, I'm trans, I'm not stupid. But eventually I found some doctors elsewhere in a different city, but it was so expensive. And you know, like trying to find a job and keep a job was, was a challenge. So when I was 17, 18, and I made a decision after a failed suicide attempt, I wanted to thrive. I just didn't want to, you know, manage. So I think coming to that decision was 
very transformative. I just said to people, you know, this is who I am, take it or leave it. I got two gifts. One was that I grew up in a in a household where my parents, not in any everyday way, ever told me not to be who I was, this effeminate child. But also I grew up into spiritual outlooks that don't have a concept of guilt in the same way. I think that has been the biggest gift. Like, I don't know what it feels to be guilty or ashamed of who you are. I have been lucky somehow to find myself in places where I was able to influence. And I think it is therefore important if you have been given this opportunity by fate to use that effectively. It's a responsibility to be your honest and true self at all times. I have the gift of being the eternal minority from growing up in a mixed faith background, you know, to being a trans woman, to being a person of color here, a migrant. What is important to me, therefore, in doing this work is to try and do something to make sure that others who come after me can come on their own merit. But I think like what is most important right now is for more diverse voices to be heard, whether it is the voices of survivors of sexual violence or my colleagues who do a lot better work than I do. I, I need to make sure that my colleagues who I manage here, that their ideas really come to fruition. I mean, that is the most important reason why I do this work. What I'm really interested in is to make sure that everyone who goes through here feels that they, that they have an opportunity to express what is really going on for them. That's why it's important, because this movement, particularly the women's movement, the feminist women's movement, that is built on the history of so many women who've transformed. One of the dangers of being this movement sometimes is that we don't know when to let more people sit on the table. And I think I do know the importance of it, because I just don't want to be the token trans VME woman in Scotland for many things, in many spaces. Uh, hopefully that will not be forever. And hopefully people won't call me to speak at events anymore. Because I think that that is important too. We have to become redundant. Yeah. That's why it's important. I'm here in Ipswich today to meet a friend of mine, Leo. I know Leo from a acting course that we were on a few years ago. So let's go say hi to Leo, shall we? Hey! Hi, Leo. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Oh, it's so good to see you. I'm Leo. I'm trans and a bit of a party. I'm gay. I'm a diversity trainer, I'm a model, I'm a dog lover, and I'm a partner. Leo, you're a, a life model, you're a speaker, you're the subject of all of this art in this um, gallery space. And I can see over here that you also do poetry, so tell me a bit about that. I do poetry, because I also do good and about many things for about two years and we created this sort of body of work um, with the name the, the chicken um, it kind of shows um, that my disability and also my gender identity very curious um, always being something quite private for me and I tend to only be able to write when I'm feeling a very strong emotion. But when I worked with Annabelle, I felt I wanted to add some of my poetry to some of her artwork. So on this, these two perfect pieces were actually Back to back, and we, we based the idea on the King Grant Woman. The Kissing Ladies. Do you mind if I read it? Yeah. I am your target. 
the social constraints you normally have fail you. I pose as a designer. A high-pitched, patronizing voice. I'm not a dog. I feel obliged to let you touch me. The social interaction from which I am absent lasts a period of time before the need you feel wears and you leave. That is about how strangers tend to come up to me and talk to me just because I have a disability and I feel like that okay to come and talk to me and for some reason they talk to me in a high pitch voice. <laughs> Like you were talking, yeah, oh, it's yeah. so nice to see you. How are you doing? Yeah. So I can see that in these paintings that you're wearing some sort of giant dress. The old teacher wanted me to actually wear her wedding dress for the project. And we wanted to do total masculinity and femininity. That way you can see my jeans and my big boots. Um, underneath the dress, I was very shocked at how uncomfortable I actually felt in the dress and I couldn't wait to get out of it. <laughs> so you're kind of pushing yourself outside your comfort yeah. zone for the sake of art. I mean, as we both know, a dress doesn't make a man or a woman, it's just no. clothing, but it's funny how certain items can make us feel more like ourselves. For me, it very much as though having been in charge of what I wore, not having it dictated by someone else. And also, you're, you're you now. I began my transition in 2012, that I feel a lot more comfortable with my body, like, inside and out. So I guess it nowadays it doesn't matter so much what I wear as I eat it. Two of the two on my right hand side she actually needed in um, one sitting each. And the what the one on the far right of my back is like a quite significant for me. It was before I had my surgery and I had always been quite a change of my back and how it looked and that was it the first time I allowed someone to photograph it or something positive. That's the beauty of, of this art, it's about turning difficult situations into beautiful things. There's a huge amount of trust that you have to put into something like this and a lot of work. It seems like a really nice collaboration with you two. I actually went over to her house every week. When I was sitting with her, all I would do was chat to her. So I really think the work is so significant because she, she grew to know me quite well. So, tell me this work that you do as a life model, it's pretty intimate stuff. What made you want to get into this line of work? In my early career, I modeled for the Welcome to Project on a disability um, awareness campaign. I've also modeled at the stage for career now. So, Leo, why do you think it's important that someone who's queer and trans um, should be doing this, sort, this kind of work, life modelling? A lot of people always um, don't really think about disabled people having much of a body image and a sexuality to and put my work through modern and also diversity speaking I hope to change people's views a bit. And uh, people with several body can be proud of their bodies. Um, and the fact that I am trying to kind of another layer on that topic. I think it's important for people to 
，你之前呢？你之前都本身还占过一个目前的男绝爱的主持人，这个。哎呀，二年之外的男。哎呀，这不不对，还能弄谁干？那弄什么？